Amen. Cool. It's nice and hot. <laughs> I'm not complaining. Right. Anyway, we are in Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 12. And if you were with us last week, you would know we looked at how Jesus responded to the Pharisees who openly accused him of working by the power of Elzebub. They accused him of working by the power of Satan. And they did this because the multitudes were asking the religious leaders the question, could this be the son of David? Could this be the Messiah? That's what the, the, the multitudes were asking. And, and because the religious leaders obviously didn't want to endorse Jesus, they said, no, he's not. He works by the power of Satan, Beelzebub. And so Jesus responded to them and he told them that their argument, their logic was just not, it was illogical because, you know, any kingdom fighting against itself will not be able to stand. And so he sort of like said to them, look, your argument doesn't even make sense. And the fact that you're attributing what I do to, to Satan, you know, what you're doing is like sins against the, the son will be give, forgiven you know, blasphemy against the Father of the King, but, but the work of the Holy Spirit, that's like the unpardonable sin because if somebody lives their whole life, we, we, we considered, and they do not accept that prompting on their heart, that, that prompting in their mind to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, then, then what can the Father do? You've made your choice, you've made your decision, okay? It's the work of the Holy Spirit now to convict the world of sin and draw them, introduce them to the Son, as it were. And so, Jesus said that basically that's the impardonable sin. And he says that they speak evil because it was, um, the words that they spoke were evil because it just showed what the condition of their heart was. And we looked at the verse which says, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so we considered sort of like the words we use, the conversations we have. Jesus says, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. But I say to you that for every, how many? Every idle word men may speak, they will give an account of it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, or by your words you will be condemned. And so we considered it again for the believer. We will give an account of our life and our works and our words at the Bema Seat of Christ. Anybody ever heard of the Bema Seat of Christ? Yeah. Amen. Romans 14.10. And for the unbeliever, it will unfortunately be the great white throne judgment spoke of in Revelation 20. And so this is the scene, the altercation which the Pharisees brought before Jesus because he had um, basically um, healed someone who was deaf and who was mute. And so after Jesus said these things, it says in verse 38, if we're in chapter 12, it says, then some of the scribes and the Pharisees answered saying, teacher, we want to see a sign from you. Now, just pause in there for a moment. At first reading, at first glance, if you was reading, tracking through the Gospel of Matthew, you may just read this and, feel, and, 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 and think that it sounds like a sincere request, right? Amen? Amen. Would you? Do you know what I mean? It seems like, but it's not a sincere request. I mean, after, as, as, again, after having this harsh, harsh altercation with Jesus, this was anything but sincere. This was actually the scribes and the Pharisees' last ditch attempt to discredit Jesus before the people. And what the religious leaders were actually saying to the people is that, guys, Jesus has not yet validated his credentials to be Messiah. And what Jesus actually needed to do was he, he needed to give them a sign. But not just any old sign. They wanted a sign which is something cosmic. Jesus, 
turned the sun into blood. Jesus calls it to go from day to night. Jesus, do something miraculous like, show us the finger of God. Do you remember the finger of God in, in the book of Daniel? Many, many, is it many, many, many? Many, 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 tekel abhashini. Give us a sign, Jesus. Prove to us that you are indeed the son of God. So what they wanted to do is they wanted to embarrass Jesus because Jesus obviously wasn't going to do it, right? And so they would turn around and say, aha, we told you all, he's a fraud. He's not the son of God. See, so that was their intention. So picking up in verse 39, it says, but he answered and said to them, an evil and an adulterous generation seek after a sign. And no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it. Because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And indeed, a greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise up in judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And indeed, a greater than Solomon is here. So, pause in there. They, they ask the question. And it says, but he answered and said to them, it's an evil and adulterous generation that seeks after a sign. That's interesting, right? Because modern, modern Christianity, modern charismatic, charismatic Christianity is very much about signs, isn't it? Very much about signs and wonders and Come and receive your healing. Come and see the signs. Who would you believe? Whose report would you believe? Their report or Jesus' report? Jesus' report says an evil and adulterous generation does what? It takes after a sign. So those who are seeking after signs, already the motivation is wrong, right? Already something's flawed. And so this is exactly how Jesus described this generation which he was born into. But the characteristic sort of like continues, doesn't it? People seeking after signs. And so he says that this particular generation had an evil heart. They were evil because they had an evil heart. From the heart proceeds evil words, right? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And they were adulterous in, na in nature. I mean, they'd learnt the mistake of not necessarily going after foreign gods, like before the Babylonian captivity, but they were trying to find God through religion and not relationship. In 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul picks up on this and he says, For Jews request a sign, and Greeks seek after wisdom. And I would say that most people basically can be put into these two categories. You either find the person who you're witnessing to and they say, "Show, Prove it to me. Show me a sign. Show me something which so that I can believe. Or they want this kind of like deeper knowledge. This selective knowledge, and then I'll believe. So, Jesus said, it's an evil and adulterous generation which seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given to it except. And so we have the exception clause here, right? Except. So there's, there's something to be learned from what Jesus is going to, going to say, right? And it was specific to this generation, but we, we can take great courage from it as well, right? Because we look back and we see exactly what happened. So 
This was the only sign they were getting. And with saying these things, Jesus basically, basically completely validates the story of the prophet Jonah. He says, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Now, if you sort of like look at, go on to Google and everything, people want to discredit that whatever happened to Jonah actually happened to Jonah. They don't believe. They just believe it was just a made-up story. Jesus validates it and says it was true. Who are you going to believe? ka -ching. Whose report will you believe? I will believe the report of the Lord. That's how the song goes, right? And so he says, no sign will be given except the sign of Jonah. Now, just considering Jonah, because Jonah in so many ways pictures humanity, it pictures us in our fallen state, doesn't it? The picture of Jonah. Because I say that because Jonah was basically told to go in one direction, to live his life in one particular way, but Jonah decided to go in the completely opposite direction. And I would say that most people, humanity, basically tries to live their lives for themselves, going in their own way, which is opposite to a life with Christ. Until Christ comes and arrests the heart, brings revelation of who he is, and then now we start making our way back to Christ, right? Back to God. So the picture of Jonah in so many ways pictures us. It pictures humanity, I would say. And then we see how when Jonah had run out of himself, like many of us do when we try to live our lives for ourselves, When we try to work out this thing called life in our own strength and we see that it doesn't work, just like Jonah, there needed to be this kind of like death resurrection experience. And so we could see it through the, you know, you know, just having an overview of Jonah that very much pictures us. But it pictures us in the, that, that sense, but it doesn't picture Christ, right? Because Christ wasn't trying to work out this thing called life. He wasn't going in the opposite direction to what the Father had called him to do. He was an obedient son, right? So it doesn't picture Christ. The scripture says that, you know, he's not working at this thing called life because he is life. He is the life, and in him, in him was the life of all men, as it says in, in John. But Jesus goes on to say, for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish. Now, I think the King James Version says well, right? I think it does. But I'm not sure if it was a well. I just think it was just a great fish. Yeah. Ketos in the Greek. Um, we we all, all, always want to label things. And so we say, it's a well, right? Because it's the biggest fish, right? Fish. Mammal. <laughs> the biggest mammal, right? And so, um, yeah, so who knows? God could have just created just a one-off great fish for that specific purpose. It came, it did what it needed to do, and it was gone or whatever. I don't know. But Jesus is validating the story, so I believe it to be true. So... He says, for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so, in like manner, so will the Son of Man, so Jesus is speaking about himself, be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So, so Jesus gave these religious leaders who asked him for a sign, he gave them the typology of Jonah. And he tells them, he shows us that Jonah is a picture of prophecy. And in that it looked like there was no way out for Jonah. It looked like it was the end of Jonah. But God miraculously made Jonah come back from impending death. And the great fish, whatever fish it was, whatever mammal it was, 
basically spat Jonah out, right? But as we know, Jesus literally came back from literal death, unlike Jonah. And why? Because as it says, I think it's in the Psalms, and it says in the book of Acts that death couldn't hold him, right? Oh, death, where is your sting? So Jesus said this is the only sign they were getting. So I don't know if you ask yourself these questions, but three days and three nights? And the thing is, if we, if we look at Scripture from a Western mindset, we have problems because we're literally thinking about three days and three nights. And if we look at the resurrection, we look at, you know, um, um, Easter, Passover, and we're like, well, Jesus wasn't there three days and, three, you know, 72 hours. But within, within a Hebrew mindset, within an Eastern mindset, any part of a day constituted the day. Does that make sense? So, so I can say, for example, I went to Miami and I spent a day. Does that mean I spent a 24-hour period? It doesn't necessarily mean I spent a 24-hour period, right? I could have just got flown in, which I actually did, <laughs> and we flew out. But I say to people, oh, I spent a day or a couple hours. You, you, you see my point? So within a Hebrew mindset, it's any part of it constitutes it. Right? And so that's what Jesus is saying. And again, we have to look at Scripture not through Western lenses, but through Hebrew lenses, through Eastern lenses, because then we're kind of like able to make right choices and, and decipher exactly what's going on. So he says, So will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, which, again, may be what Peter is alluding to in 1 Peter 3. We're not going to go there. And so what is Jesus saying? He's saying to the scribes and the Pharisees, the only sign which the nation would get from him was the sign of death, burial, resurrection. That's what he said he was going to give them. And so within the context now, thinking of the book of Jonah, Jonah, was he sent to Jews or was he sent to Gentiles? Gentiles. And he wasn't just sent to, to, to any old Gentiles. He was sent to the Ninevites, who were wicked, heathen Gentiles. I mean, again, I can't go for it now, but you just look at some of the accounts of the, of the Ninevites. They were wicked people. And that's why Jonah says, what? You want me to go to Nineveh? Them the people? No, I'm not going. I'm going the opposite direction. Because he didn't want to go. But even though he eventually got there, it, the story is about Gentiles who actually repented. They actually repented when they heard the message of Jonah. And the message of Jonah was eight words. That was his message. <laughs> Yet 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Eight words. He went round there preaching eight words and the whole place got shook. And that's what he would have made, wanted the scribes and the Pharisees to start thinking about the book of Jonah. What happened in the book of Jonah? That's what he wants them to think about. But then Jesus adds something which the, the book of Jonah doesn't add. It doesn't say. Jesus says, the men of Nineveh, or Nineveh, however you pronounce it, will rise up in judgment. The men of Nineveh will rise up in judgment? What are you talking about, Jesus? You see, this would have got the religious leaders mad because they're Gentiles. Judgment against who? Judgment against this generation and condemn it. That would have made them mad because keeping within the context of this, this death, burial, resurrection kind of like thought processes, thought process. In the past, in the book of Jonah, Jonah had a death, 
burial, resurrection experience. But now Jesus is speaking about something future. You see that? The men of Nineveh will rise up when? In the future. In judgment against this present generation. That's what Jesus is saying here. Do you see that? And so Jesus is talking about this this resurrection. He's talking about something which is going to happen in the future and that he is the resurrection and the life. And he says that they will rise up in the future and have a resurrection experience. And in the future, they will be in a position where they will judge Jews. Gentiles judging Jews. Can you see how it, it must have got them riled? And so this is what Jesus says, and he said, and the word judgment here, which is interesting because we spent a lot of time on, on looking at the word judgment. Does anybody remember what the word is? Carino, anacreo, and diacreo, or diacreno. So, so to crino is to judge, to condemn, right? But this isn't the word which is actually used here. It's crisis. And so crisis is actually a tribunal. It means tribunal. So they're going to rise up as a tribunal, as, as a, as a God-ordained court, as it were, in the future to judge that generation. That's what Jesus is saying. And they're going to judge that generation and judge the people of that day who literally had the Messiah right before them. And what did they do with the Messiah? They rejected him. Jonah had a message. The people of Nineveh repented. The people have Messiah right before them, and they reject him. So is Jesus saying it's cool. The people of Nineveh are going to rise up in the future and judge you because they repented at eight words. He says, why? Because the people of Nineveh repented at the preaching of Jonah. See, repentance is always the key. You know, repentance is always the first step. Repentance from dead works, and then what we do is then faith towards God. You see, just repenting is good, but it's not the whole package. And Jesus is going to go on to this as we go forward. Just repenting is good, but then you have to have faith towards God. Faith towards God. And so, you know, I just want to back up with the book of Jonah. Just, just a couple of verses. It says, then the word came to the king. So Jonah's gone with his eight words. And that word has, has gone to the king of Nineveh now. The word came to the king of Nineveh. And he arose from his throne and laid aside his robe, covered himself with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, let neither man nor beast nor flock taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water, but let a man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who can tell if God will turn And relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. Verse 10. Then God saw their works. That they turned from their evil way. And God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them. And he did not do it. God changed his mind. Through repentance, God changed his mind, right? He saw the actions of these people and he's like, okay, you've repented. And it's genuine repentance. I changed my mind. And I think if you look into the account, after that generation had passed away, they just went back to their evil, wicked ways and everything. And God judged judged Nineveh. And so that's the response which Jesus wanted from the religious leaders, what he wanted from the nation of Israel. Repent. Know who is before you. But they rejected him. And then Jesus says, and guess what? They repented because of Jonah's message, and a greater than Jonah 
is here. You elevate Jonah. There's a book in the scriptures about Jonah. And guess what? A greater than Jonah is here. And if we look at Jesus compared to Jonah, there's no comparison really, is it? But Jesus is great. He's a greater person than Jonah. You know, Jesus is greater because he was obedient where Jonah was disobedient and went in the opposite direction. You know, Jonah had no love for the people. Do you remember after he spoke the message and everything, he went and plotted underneath a, uh, what? Yeah, and then God gave him shade and he complained or something, didn't he? You know, it's like he hated the people. Jesus loves all people, right? You know, Jonah's message was a message of wrath, of judgment. But Jesus' message is, is a message of love and grace and salvation. You know, Jonah didn't actually die. He was in the great fish, but he didn't actually die. But Jesus literally died, was buried, and he rose again, right? Jonah only went to Nineveh, whereas Jesus ministers to the whole world. And so there's so many things, comparisons, or things we can say, well, Jesus is greater than Jonah, right? But Jesus gives them the first example, the first sign, which would be the sign of Jonah. And then he goes on to say, and he gives an example of another Gentile. And I just feel like these religious leaders must have been really like, oh, my goodness, where is this guy going? Another, another Gentile. He says, the queen of the south will rise up in judgment with this generation and condemn it. The queen of the south, the queen of Sheba. We can read about the queen of the south in 1 Kings 10. And so the Queen of the South, the Queen of Sheba, a Gentile woman who was immensely wealthy. And Jesus says that she too will one day in the future be part of this tribunal who will condemn this particular, that particular generation. She will rise up in the future. She will resurrect and condemn God's chosen people. Why? Why? For she came from the ends of the earth. And so we look at the queen of Sheba. She wasn't necessarily invited by Solomon. But she chose to go visit Solomon because she heard about his great wisdom and his wealth. And she thought, wow, I need to go check this guy out. And so she came from the ends of the earth, just meaning she was a long, long, long way away. And she came to Solomon where there was, because she heard through word of mouth, right? There's, there's no iPhone, there's no WhatsApp, there's no Insta, there's no social media. So she has to get on a, a camel in a carriage and travel through the dusty, harsh desert, wherever she was, to go to Israel to visit Solomon, she had to take it upon herself to be active. She was willing to cross the harsh desert just to hear, verse 42, the wisdom of Solomon. And I find that amazing. And not to be too harsh, but she was willing to travel across a harsh desert She's the queen, so maybe just in a carriage. And sometimes we find it difficult just to turn up on, to church on a Sunday. But she was willing to make that journey, to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And it's interesting because, again, just touching on 1 Kings 10 a little bit, it says, And when the queen of Sheba had seen all the wisdom of Solomon the house that he had built, the food on his table, the seating of his servants, the service of his waiters and their apparel, his cupbearers and his entry by which he went up to the house of the Lord. There was no more spirit in her. She's like, oh my goodness, this is too much. It's a, whoa, wow, wow. Then she said to the king, it was a true report which I heard in my own land about your words and your wisdom. However, I did not believe the words until I came and saw with my own eyes. And indeed, the half was not told to me. 
Your wisdom and prosperity exceed the fame of which I heard. Happy are your men and happy are these your servants who stand continually before you and hear your wisdom. Blessed be the Lord your God who delighted in you, setting you on the throne of Israel because the Lord has loved Israel forever. Therefore, he made you king to do justice and righteousness. So that's powerful. That's her evaluation of the things she's seen and the things she heard about Solomon. About Solomon. What does Jesus say next? And indeed, a greater than Solomon is here right before you. Right before you. And so all the fine clothes, all the, 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 the fine array of clothes and gold and houses and servants and, and everything and, and wealth, what Solomon had cannot be compared to Jesus. To sit at the, 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 the Lord's table, I mean, we, 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 we speak about the marriage supper of the Lamb, right? Whatever that means. The marriage supper of the land. And to, to, to hear the words of Jesus and to receive his eternal blessings. It cannot be compared to that of Solomon. But Solomon gives us this earthly perspective of a heavenly reality. If that makes sense. And so Jesus told him that. In the future judgment, which I said, Revelation 20, 12, it will be better for Gentiles, Gentiles who sought after him and repented than for these religious leaders who basically rejected him and for the people who rejected him because they literally had the Son of God before them and they didn't care. And I suppose the lesson is, the greater the opportunity to receive understanding and salvation, the greater, and you reject it, the greater the judgment. And so we live in the West, you know, and everybody's heard of Jesus, right? Everybody can have access to a Bible. Everybody can have access to listening to Premier Radio or, you know, have Bible apps and everything. And so to live your whole life and not even avail yourself of the information, I will say potentially greater is the judgment in God's eyes. So Jesus basically gives them the sign of Jonah and the references of, of Solomon, the reference of the Queen of Sheba and, um, and Nineveh being Gentiles and the Queen of the South, the Queen of Sheba being a Gentile and how they're going to judge Jews. And that would have made them even more mad. And then Jesus basically gives a striking parable which connects right back to the beginning of the chapter. So when you're reading Matthew, you kind of like, you've got to keep things in sync because it kind of like goes back and forward. It goes cyclical, okay? And so he gives them a parable which goes back to the beginning when Jesus cast out the, the, the demon, the unclean spirit from the man who was deaf and mute and with the religious leaders openly rejecting him. And he says, when an unclean spirit, verse 43, goes out of a man, he goes through dry places seeking rest and finds none. Then he says, I, ret I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept, and put in order. And then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. So shall it also be with this wicked generation. So, what's going on? Jesus, in a sense, brings the conversation, the subject matter, full circle. And in this parable, Jesus is speaking of the nation of Israel. He's speaking of, of, the, of religious Israel as the man. Right? Can you, I hope you can see that, right? 
when an unclean spirit goes out of a man. So, so the man is Israel, religious Israel, the nation. And basically, Jesus is saying how they were prepared for Messiah. John the Baptist came along, and John the Baptist's message was a message of preparation. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God is at hand, right? It's preparation. And all of Israel went out to the Jordan to be baptized for the mission of sins, right? It's He's the voice of one crying in the wilderness, preparing the way of the Lord. Preparation. After, so in a sense, what John the Baptist was doing when people were going out to baptize, he was cleansing the nation. Cleansing the nation in preparation for Messiah. And so they were cleansed, but then the next step which they needed to do was is they needed to receive Messiah. And then, if I could say it this way, be filled by the teaching and the life of Messiah. Does that make sense? Repentance from dead works has to have... Faith towards God. So they were cleansed, but they had not received Messiah. So in effect, their house was empty, swept, and put in order. You're ready for Messiah, right? But you have to receive Messiah. Could you see that? And so... When the unclean spirit goes out of a man, the unclean spirit goes through dry places, seeking rest, and finds none. So, I'm not exactly sure what dry places means. But, something we can all relate to this summer. <laughs> Is the grass green at the moment? <laughs> Is the grass green? dry <laughs> it's dry right and it's not giving any nourishment or anything because it's dry all right and so 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 maybe dry places is lifeless places potentially i don't do your own investigation yeah so does it depict that there's no life but what is the unclean spirit seeking to do it's seeking to find rest. Is that what the text says? It's seeking rest. It's seeking rest. Now, I would say it's seeking rest before the final judgment because unclean spirits have a final judgment. But in the meantime, the in-between time, they're seeking rest somewhere. And they, don't want to, they can't find it in dry places. So they're looking for a host. All right? And so, then he says, the unclean spirit, then he says, I will return to my house. And I think that's funny because it's like the unclean spirit is going on as if he owned the house in the first place. I'm going to go back to my house. <laughs> From which I came, and when he, the unclean spirit, comes, he finds it empty and swept and put in order. And so, again, as I said before, Christ has not, was not given the opportunity to fill that house, to fill that life, if we can say it in those terms. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits. So the picture is this like, he's come back to his house, he's like, what? Empty, sweat clean, I'm going to get the boys. Goes and gets, as the text says, seven other spirits. Now, I personally think, you know, that it's not literally seven. Seven in, the, in, in Scripture is the number of fullness, right? Completeness. And so the, 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 the man at the tomb of the Gadarenes, he had how many unclean spirits within him? A legion, right? Up to 6,000. So seven, 6,000, two, one. You get the point. That's what I think is. Seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter and they dwell. They, they're like, oh, yeah, this is cool. We're going to plot here. We're going to take up residence. And it says that in the last state of that man is worse than the first. So shall it also be with this wicked generation. And so, and so 
we, in, within its context, Jesus is speaking about that specific generation. So shall it be with this wicked generation. And, his, you know, if you look at history from this time when they rejected him and then Jesus ultimately um, crucified, from that time until now, if we look at modern Judaism, modern Judaism is just a poor and a pale representation of what a relationship with Yahweh should actually look like. I mean, you go to, is it Stanford Hill? You go to Stanford Hill and you see the Orthodox Jews and everything. They're not trying to sort of like have any friendships or relationship with Gentiles. <laughs> They're an isolated community, right? They do their thing. They're not trying to reach out to the world to reveal Yahweh to the world. They're not doing that. You don't hear of, of people in, in Israel sort of like sending out missionaries we need to let you know about the God of, of, of Israel, the God of the Bible. Forget whether they believe in Jesus or not. You don't have everybody knocking on your door with the hat and the ringlets and everything asking you if you know Yahweh. Anyone? Megaphone on the corner. You know, you must believe in Yahweh. You're not going to see it. And so basically, from this time until now, they have not been trying to reach the world with a message of salvation. Who's been trying to reach the world with a message of salvation? Gentiles. Gentiles preaching the message of a Jewish man. So, Jesus speaks about this specific generation, but you know, some look at this text there and and they 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 kind of like believe that it also speaks of a person who who basically once you know tried to live a moral life, you know, came to a place where they were about to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior. In a sense, they were cleansed. In a sense, but they didn't go through with repentance from dead works which needs to be filled now with faith towards God. And if you don't fill your life with faith towards God, your initial position can be worse than your ending position. Now, some of us may have friends or may know people who basically used to be Christians. Used to be Christians, but maybe got burnt by a church, maybe kind of like got burnt by a friendship. And so they put all that blame at the Lord's door. Oh, so those people over there burnt you and everything, but you're putting it at Jesus' door and you want nothing to do with Jesus. That don't make sense. It wasn't Jesus' fault. It's someone who's trying to represent Jesus. It was their fault. But now you put it at the door of Jesus and therefore no longer want to live a life which is according to biblical Christianity. Potentially your state afterwards is worse than your state before because you know, but you choose not to. Do you see that? So some people look, and some people, you know, see it as being that. You know, I don't believe everybody's demon-possessed. I don't believe that. But, you know, some people come out of very, very volatile situations and circumstances. Christ basically gets them out, cleans them up and everything, and then they don't follow through. And then they go back into being in that volatile Horrible circumstance, horrible life. We all know stories and see pictures of it, right? So, some people see that. Now, continuing on, and I can just hope that you do your own investigation into the text. Verse 46 says, Now, while he was still speaking to the multitudes, behold, his mother and brothers stood outside seeking to speak with him. So, Words got out to Mary. Words got out to Mary and her other boys. Yes, Mary had other children. She's not a perpetual virgin. She had other children. And words got back to them that Jesus, your son, is taking on the religious establishment. And guess what, Mary? 
They're plotting to kill him. They're plotting to destroy him. And so basically Mary and the boys, they come to Jesus and they wanted to speak to Jesus because they want to take Jesus home. Jesus, you're taking this God thing too far. Jesus, you, you know, you can't take on the religious establishment. You need to come home with us. And so he says, then one said to him, look, your mother and your brothers are, are standing outside seeking to speak with you. And I believe if this was to anyone else apart from Jesus, this would have been embarrassing. Your mum's outside. <laughs> she wants to speak to you, Jesus. I'm a big man, you know. Nah, she wants to speak to you. You're no, you're no, you're you got to go on a naughty step. It would have been embarrassing for anybody else apart from Jesus, I think. Your mum's outside. She wants to take you home. But he answered and said to the one who told him, who is my mother and who are my brothers? So they are, they, they, they're asking him a question and saying, your mom's out there. Well, you, he's like, I, I'm going to ask you. I ask you a question in turn. Who are, who is my mother and my brothers? And, you know, when Jesus asks this question, he's throwing it out to, 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 to the world. Who's, who's the Lord's? Mother and brother, and who's his family? You know, who's and he stretched out his hand toward his disciples and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and my sister and my mother. So Jesus makes it very, very clear. If you're part of his family, you've got to have corresponding evidence. Whoever does the will of my father in heaven. That's my family. If you're not doing the will of my father who's in heaven, guess what? You may think you're my family, but you're not my family. So, Jesus makes it clear. And so, it's doing the will of the Father. And we say this all the time, don't we? Doing the will of the Father. Jesus, you know, on the night before he was arrested, or the night of his arrest, he says, Father, if there's any, if there's any way of you taking this cup from before me, boy, if there's another way of securing salvation for humanity, I beg you, let's do it that way. And then he comes to him, he goes, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. So as a son, he, he learned obedience through the things he suffered, right? So the same thing for us. We have to do the will of the Father. The only way we're going to know to do the will of the Father is if we know his word. It starts off with repentance from dead works, but repentance from dead works has to now be filled with faith towards God. Applying faith towards God. It has to be. Otherwise, you've just, in a sense, cleansed the house, and the house is waiting to be filled with something else. And so, the sign which Jesus gave them was this. The sign of death, burial, and resurrection. The resurrection, you cannot get away from it. Not resuscitation, not reincarnation, the resurrection. You believe that Jesus literally died, was buried, rose again, was in, ascended into heaven, and one day will, ret will return for his bride, the church. It sounds like a, a, a film, right? <laughs> Star Wars or something. But it's the truth. It's life. Do you believe it? And if you believe it, the sign that you are actually one of the Lord's family is that you do the will of the Father. You do his will. And so Jesus is saying, to have relationship with him, it's a spiritual relationship. It's a born again and obedience and faith towards God relationship. A life of sanctification, that type of relationship. And... You know, just thinking about these things, it reminded me of, of what Matthew has already spoken about the Lord's words in, in Matthew chapter 7. Which says, 
Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord. So it seems like they think they've got a relationship. They feel like, yeah, me and Jesus are tight, right? Lord, Lord. Shall enter the kingdom of heaven. So it's not just saying. It's saying and. But he who does the will of my father in heaven. See, Jesus is using the same language. It's the same message. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, haven't I not prophesied in your name? Cast out demons in your name and done many wonders in your name and an evil and adulterous generation seeks after signs and wonders. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. I don't know you. Keep it moving. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine, hears these sayings of mine. What's the cue? What's the, what's the, what's the, cue? What's, what's, what's the key to the whole thing? Hearing these sayings of mine. Not just hearing any old thing. These sayings of mine. Whoever hears these sayings of mine, not of Buddha, not of Allah, not of Muhammad, whatever, these sayings of mine, and does them. See, it's not just hearing, it's the doing. I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on a rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat on that house. Sometimes we feel like life is beating on us, right? But if we're founded on the rock, it says, and it did not fall. Why? Because it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these things of mine and does not do them will be likened to a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat on that house. Same things, right? Same elements, same experiences through life, but one's founded on the rock, the other one's founded on sand, and it says the one found it and it fell and beat on and it fell and great, great was its fall. So basically, Jesus is saying to these religious leaders, right, you've made up your mind, you do not receive me as Messiah. Fine. You've made that decision for yourself. You've made that decision for the nation, and it's all good. But the decision you've made, you will be judged by. And I'm going to give it a sign, not as a nation, but as individuals who can come into relationship with me. And that's where Jesus is going to go on from this point as well. Amen? So I hope that wasn't too confusing for you today. Um, But challenging, eh? Challenging the... Jesus, you know, he puts the line in the sand and he wants us to be on his side. You know, there's no gray areas areas within the kingdom. You're either for him or you're against him, as we looked at last week. And so, Father, we thank you that we have ears that hear. And we thank you, Lord, that we have the scriptures, Lord, and we can read and get to know and understand your sayings lord so that we can live a life which is a life of obedience unto you lord help us to go through that process of sanctification it's not always easy lord it's not always easy to pick up our cross daily to die to self to to in every situation to say oh wow i really want to do this but not my will your will be done lord it's hard but You know, you've given us your spirit, Lord. You've given us your strength in order to overcome these things. And your word says that, you know, to he or she who overcomes, Lord, you would give us blessings. You would give us rewards, Lord. Eternal blessings and eternal rewards, Lord. And so that's the greater good we're looking for, Lord. And so continue just to bless our time with each other. Continue to bless this day, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.